Hard Bargainers and Standards. One of my students went to McDonald's to get some French fries at 5 minutes to 11 one night. The fries were soggy. He asked the count clock for fresh fries. The clock snapped at him in reply. We are closing in five minutes. So the student calmly walked to the end of the counter, picked up a printed copy of McDonald's Freshness Guarantee, and walked back to the clock. I'm here at McDonald's, right? The student said. The clock grunted offer multiply where the student said this freshness guarantee says your food is absolutely fresh during all business hours. He pointed to the French prize part of the guarantee which promised the perfect texture that customers have come to expect. Isn't this store open until 11 p.m.? The student added. It doesn't say here that this freshness guarantee expires five minutes before closing time, does it? Did the student get fresh French fries? Is deep. Many people would have accepted the soggy French fries, was thumbed out, or argued angrily, or otherwise gotten upset. This student decided to calmly use the standards that McDonald's set for itself. It's a small thing for sure, but in thousands of negotiations, large and small, from restaurant to your job, to geopolitics, using other people's standards is a highly persuasive way to achieve your goals. Using the other person's standards is one of the great negotiation tools that most people don't know about. Standards are especially effective with hard bargainers. Few people know about them. Few people use them, and almost no one understands the psychological level that enable them to work in all kinds of situations. I'm not talking about objective standards or criteria that you think are fair. Standards are criteria that the other party thinks are fair. When invoked, they new, usually work like magic. And you can use this negotiation tool every single day. And in some cases, more than any other. Using their standards is important because the world is an unfair place. People and companies violate their own standards all the time. They make service promises and break them. You order something from the store and it is not delivered as promised. They promise great service and treat you terribly and you rely on what they said and then Often, um, apologetically, they go back on their word. It drives many people crazy. Now you can calmly use their standards to get one new want. The late team, who sold, host to ambitious middle press, was often praised for his brilliant reporting. One of the things 
he would do while interviewing national politicians was play back to them on national TV previous statements they had made that seemed to contradict their current behavior. The politicians would scoff and then be forced to justify themselves. This was using their standards. I discovered the power of using other people's standards as a journalist more than 30 years ago and we find my use of it as an attorney and businessman. It has been an essential part of our toolkit in many class. How does it work? It is fundamental tenet of human psychology that people hate to contradict themselves. So if you give people a choice between being consistent with their standards, with what they have said and promised previously, and contradicting their standards, people will usually strive to be constant with their standards. Of course, no two works all the time, but you will get much more from using these tools. People will violate their own standards less often, and you will get what you want more often. The power of standards. A standard is a practice, polish, and reference point that gives your decision legitimacy. It can be a previous statement, promise, or guarantee, or it can be a practice agreed upon by the other party for negotiation. Company polish is a standard. Essentially, it says these are our Another standard equally powerful that can be invoked is Has your company in each history ever made an exception to company policy? The next time an airline ticket agent tells you it's $100 to change your ticket, ask whether the company in each history has ever made an exception to this policy. If it has, try to fit into one of the exceptions. Start by trying this negotiation tool with service providers since they are in the business of serving others and almost always have guarantees or standards of service. Cable TV companies, phone companies, airlines, credit card companies, banks, hotels, etc. If you have an issue to bring up, find out what the company says about customer service on its website or in print or TV ads. If a service representative is unhelpful or rude to you, say to them your ads, talk about how customer service reps always try to help poor to customers. I'm curious, how does that compared to that situation. People will not hang up, walk away, or punch you out. In fact, they will usually do what you want them to do. Some years ago, a water school, Jason Clay, tried for three years running to get into Penn Law School. He was admitted the first year the second year, he was on the waiting list and not admitted. The third year, he was on the waiting list in late April and needed, needed an answer immediately in order to pursue a joint degree program with Watton. Where he had already completed the first year of a two-year program. The law school did not usually make waiting list decision until the summer. Too late for him, given the requirements, of course, registrations and summer plans. So he wanted to be admitted and get an exception that is first consideration. Anyone who knows the application process to a top school 
understands that his chances seem to be about zero. Jason was a student in my negotiation class at Walton, so he asked me what he might do. I suggested that he go through the panel admission catalog and research the school's standards. Then he should write a letter to the dean of admission and simply say, here's your standards, here's how I meet it, here's your standards, here's how I meet it. At the end of the letter, I suggested he say, please tell me where I'm from here, or something similar, all of which he did. He gave the letter to the admission office on April 28th. He was accepted on May 2nd. Jason was sure this was not a coincidence, especially since he had been told by the law school that the earliest he would be considered would be June. Once you recognize the power of using other people's standards, you see it everywhere. Until that, those tools are invisible. This process pro provided a powerful lesson, said Jason, who is now the vice president and chief investment officer for Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center in New York. It is one thing to talk about these tools and concepts. It is entirely another to actually see them work for me when I use them. In situations where there are no previous standards you can use, look for ways to define standards that we agree to use in negotiation. A young executive went to Hermes, the expensive French store in New York City, to buy a car. It was a $500 car reduced on sale to $250. The young executive asked the sales clerk to give to rent the scarf since it was a present for his wife's birthday. The sales clerk responded, We don't give to rent, sell items. What an outrageous thing to say for a store of the quality. But instead of getting angry, as most people would do and getting nothing, the executive asked, So if I paid full price $500 for this car, you'd give wrap it? Certainly said the search club. The executive responded, So Hermes these days is charging $250 for gift wrapping. Did the executive get us car gift wrapped, you bet. There are two basic reasons people almost always follow their own standards. The first is that their own internal moral compass tells them it's the right thing to do. They don't want to admit to themselves they are not honest. The second is that they are concerned of that violating the standards they are supposed to follow with honor or anger a third party important to them. There was, for example, who oppose the organization standards, the person violating the standards would appear unreasonable and in the worst case could be fined. Let's say you are asking for something that is perfectly reasonable and the customer service rep or the other end of the point is being real unreasonable. He or she is, in fact, violating the standards of the company. You can bring the third party into the equation by asking if the CEO of the company himself were on this phone call, would he approve? What you have done is brought the vision of an 800-pound gorilla into the conversation. The other party now knows that he or she faces a bigger risk in violating
the standards of the company. In doing due diligence on small cargo airline, I bought with a partner in the Caribbean several years ago. I visited various islands to check out the facility. It was just a company pilot and me flying in a single engine plane. It was a lovely, clear afternoon. When we landed in Tortora in the British Virgin Island, there was no one in the arrival line lounge but an immigration officer. The officer gave the pilot a hard time in filling out various forms, even though she knew the pilot and had been had seen him often over the previous ten years. And the pilot and I both had airport passes. All I wanted to do was to make sure the company's small office was in order. It was located at 50 yards from the arrival lounge. You could see the buildings from where we were standing. We looked around the lounge for standards and there are on the wall was a plate that one sometimes sees at tourist destinations. It was a statement from the Prime Minister of the British Virgin Island, and it read something like, Welcome to the British Virgin Island. Our customer and immigration officer and other service providers value are our tourists and other guests. And we'll treat you with courtesy, dignity, and respect. So I walked over to the immigration officer and said, Excuse me? Yes, she said, looking up annoyed. I pointed to the plaque and said, Are those really the words of the Prime Minister? She said, Yes, a little more tentatively. I said, So how do the words of the Prime Minister compare to this situation? We are out of there in five minutes, according to the government, the play has since been removed. Using standards. Here is a possible response to the dry cleaner upon getting a damaged shirt back. Is your policy to send the shirt back to the customer? with a fewer button than they arrived with, certainly in usage standards, but this might feel too aggressive for you. That's okay. Use the words you are comfortable with. The principle, however, is clear. Isn't it the dry cleaner's job not to lose button? Or you might say to your spouse or significant other, dear, we went to the last seven movies that you wanted to go to. Isn't it my turn to pick a movie? Again, you might want to use other one, but what you are doing here is asking the other party if they believe the choice of movies should be distributed fairly between the two of you. One of the great things about standards is that it is a transparent process. It is not manipulative. We can tell the other party exactly what you are doing. If they say, are you using standards on me? And you can say, you can reply, of course, what's wrong with using your own when considered criteria as a basis for decision? Here, you've made it a uh, standard issues to discuss their standards. I'm simply asking your company to do what it said it would, right? Some psychologists label standards as consistency traps. 
and lump them in with manipulation techniques. This gives the wrong idea about standards. You are not trying to trap anyone into anything. You are just trying to get other people to keep their promises and to do what is reasonable. What's wrong with insisting on honesty and fairness? What do you do if the other person decides to violate their standards and be dishonest where they become more extreme? which has its own risk, and as I will explain shortly. The next point to keep in mind is that you can hurt people with these tools. There's no doubt that they work. Your decision will be how far to go with them. Here's an example of how using standards can hurt people. It involves the brainwashing of U.S. prisoners of war in the Korean War in the early 1950s. The Chinese military, which supported the North Koreans, would ask American POWs, Is the United States perfect? The U.S. soldiers, of course, would respond. Nobody is perfect, so the Chinese military would ask. Would you mind? Writing this down? That is, if you believe it, we will give you a couple of cartons of cigarette for your effort. So many POWs that wrote down, yes, not perfect. A couple of weeks later, the Chinese interrogator would ask the POWs, what are some ways the United States is not perfect? The Chinese would essentially ask the, the Americans to back up their statement. Many of the POW would write down some ways the United States was not perfect and get another carton of cigarettes for their efforts. This would go on for several months in increasing levels of details. The Chinese military would then publish these wrong diatribes against the United States by U.S. soldiers written in the soldiers' own handwriting. Very few of the American POWs would go back on what they had said, since the comments were in their own handwriting. In fact, they vigorously defended what they had written. The U.S. soldiers, by definition, had been brainwashed. It was a significant psychological blow to U.S. efforts to keep up morale. Here is a example close to home of Penn Law student Neil Seth, now the general counsel of a big real estate firm, went out with some friends to Don Shula Sports Bar, a franchise start, started by the former Miami Dolphins football coach. For drinks and dinner, he ordered a beer, which did not arrive until half an hour after dinner was served. In the spirit of the class, and almost without thinking, he said, I asked if Drinks are supposed to call before dinner. The waitress apologized profusely. Nell said she added that there had been a mix-up with another table. He asked if any of these was his fault. He said no. Nell then told her to take back the beer. <clears throat> The waitress said she could not do that since she had already opened up the beer and put the chart into the computer. I asked if it was the restaurant policy to penalize customers for each mistake. They said, of course not, she said. They then asked if a drink charge or any charge would matter. 
had ever been taken off a bill after the charge had been put into the restaurant's computer. The waitress answered yes, so they wanted to know if this was the restaurant's mistake and charges had been taken off the bill before. Why was the charge being taken off the bill now? The waitress took the charge of the bill. After the waitress walked away, a friend of theirs expressed astonishment that the waitress had taken the charge of the bill. I know this restaurant chain, Nair's friend said, the money is coming out of the waitress's meager salary. Rather than appear like a fool, the waitress had essentially agreed to deprive her family maybe of a food purchase. The news that the cost of my beer was going to come out of her check stunned me. There what? <clears throat> I began to genuinely realize the power of these tools. I realized that with this power, I have a lot have a responsibility to use it wisely. <clears throat> he paid for the beer and thanked her for the lesson in human relations. He said this lesson would greatly influence his career. Knowing this, you have to decide what is comfortable for you in negotiating with others. I might try for something that you would never attempt. Thinking it unseemly, though I might ultimately get more than you. You may decide it would not have been worth it for you to feel bad. One woman in my class was sure that using the other party's standards could not possibly work. So I told her to pick my any situation and cut it out. She had bought a lot of food from Eddie Bauer, Eddie Bauer, a well-known clothing retailer. Eddie Bauer had a return lifetime money back guarantee for each clothes. So this woman went back to her apartment took all the clothes from a closet that he had bought from Eddie Bauer over the previous five years, went to the local Eddie Bauer store, slapped the clothes on the counter and said, I don't like these clothes anymore. I want my money back. Store person gave her all her money back including cash on the spot. I was never so embarrassed in my whole life. The student reported the following week. This was going too far for the student. She found out what her limits were. I advised her to avoid the situation that made her uncomfortable. But don't tell me this tool don't work, I said. Let's look more deeply into the mechanism that caused this strategy to be so effective. A few years ago, I was in Taiwan for a week on business. At the end of the week, the hotel where I stayed charged me $150 in excess fee for 150 credit card phone calls, $1, dollar per call. I was prepared to pay the calls, but there was no notice in the room about excess charge. So, I found the manager, the decision maker, and started to negotiate with her. Is your policy to charge customers for things you have not first notified them about? I said. By asking the question, I gave her the choice that I always give people when I use standards. 
that is the extreme what come to me. What was she going to say? Sure. We break the law. No problem. Uh, not likely. By law, you must give notice before charging people for anything. So she said, of course not. Where I said, ask a second question. There was no notice in the room about access fees for credit card calls. Was there? Then no, she said. But other hotels charge you. Of course they do, I said. But they notify in advance, don't they? She thought for a moment, you have a point, Mr. Diamond. She said, I'll tell you what I do. Why don't we split the difference and you pay $75? <clears throat> to which I responded, please help me out here. I'm confused. If I'm right about this, I don't owe you anything. If I'm wrong about this, I owe you $150. Where does $75 come from? Compromise is often a blade, an effective way to negotiate. At the very end, after every other tool is used and there is only a short distance to bridge, it might be okay. Both standards are much more effective. You are right, the manager said. We'll take the charge of your bill. You might find this a bit harsh, clearly. Using the right tone in such a negotiation is important. You should say all this in a calm, very sweet and reasonable tone. The key is to give them the choice as to whether to be extreme or meet your goals. Over the years, my students have gotten millions of dollars back using such methods. The real question is whether the money should be in your pocket or theirs. Particularly when they have been unfair, what if the other person doesn't want to answer your standard questions? Ask them if there is something wrong with the question, then mess answering questions or standard issue. One caution, you will frequently fail if you ask for exception with a lot of people around. Why? Because that makes it a bigger decision for the other party. If other parties over here, then they will also ask for exceptions. Being incremental, underpinning the use of standards, and indeed, all of getting was advice is the notion of being incremental. Break up a negotiation into multiple steps. Most people who are less experienced at negotiation ask others to take too big a step at once. They ask other people to make a big jump from where they are to where you want them to go. For example, my computer is broken, give me a new one. Asking the other person to make this big a jump makes it easy for the other person to say no. Big steps seem more risky to different from the current status. So you should divide the negotiation into smaller steps. You get anchoring, anchoring, and by in at each step. The distance traveled between each anchor is small. You can bring people great distance through incremental steps. You lead them from the familiar to the unfamiliar one step at a time. Essentially, you are building the foundation in each case to persuade people to go to the next step. If the other person asks where you are headed, tell them that you are trying to determine their standards. To find out what is possible in this situation, if they ask you 
more question, you disclose the information that brings you closer to your goals. What is possible here? Is thus better than I want you to give me 20% of a much bigger increment. You need to start to far back enough that they can say no to a point you've raised without their feeling foolish. Start with a picture in their heads. That's what a standard is. A picture in their heads. Most people don't go back far enough in a negotiation. You need to start with what is familiar to them and to proceed incrementally from there. What do I mean by going far back enough? Ask, for example, do you want to reach an agreement? Do you want to make a profit? Do you want to make your customers happy? It provides an anchor for the negotiations. If they say at the beginning that they want to reach an agreement, but later start making outrageous demands, you can ask the other party how this dovetails with their indication that they wanted to reach an agreement. In a negotiation, you should lead people from the familiar to the unfamiliar, step by step. The more difficult the situation, the smaller the steps you have to take, the more steps you will need. The pictures in their heads should be simple, something to which they can say no, and that you can accept. Here is an example of being incremental, starting from what is familiar. A student of mine, Rocky Motwani, went to play a tra traffic ticket at the Department of Motor Vehicles in West Philadelphia. There, in huge time, he saw a sign that said, absolutely no personal checks accepted. Rocky only had a personal check, so he decided to see if he could negotiate this. He searched around for a standard. On the back of his ticket was an address to which one could make a personal check. There was something familiar about the address. Rocky approached the window. It says on the back of my ticket that I can make a personal check to the address listed here. Is that right? Rocky said to the clerk. Yes, the clerk replied. Where exactly is this address? Rocky said. It's this building, said the clerk. Rocky paused for a moment. And where exactly in this building do the checks come to that are made in? Rocky asked. Why? That desk over there, said the clock, gesturing to a desk about six feet away. Yuri, said Rocky, contemplatively, could I ask you a question? Is there something special about that six feet? Six feet away? A personal check is okay. Six feet closure? A personal check is not okay. What if I take my check and put it in an envelope and wrap it over you and it lands on the desk over there? Can I pay my check then? I will even put a stamp on it. Did Rocky pay my check that day? He did. And 3,000 people before him did not, and probably 3,000 people after him did not. Now, you may not prefer the bit of sarcasm Rocky displayed. You might instead have asked 
if there were ever any exception to the rule of no personal checks. The point is, Rocky pointed out the appearance of parent inconsistency in the DM visuals. And in adding, so met his goals if he had tried to negotiate all at once. Why can I pay in person by personal check if I can mail one in? It would have likely been too big a job for the clerk to make. The clerk needed to see every step of the thought process. Uh, Rocky has since become a managing director at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, running a uh, 200 million dollars business. Today, he says, I use the negotiation tools actively and daily, particularly being incremental. Here is an example from business situation. Murray Hamsley, a manager for BASF Bus, was told by a large, a large customer that Bus needed to put barcodes on all of each package. The customer said it would it hold four hundred and fifty dollars. Of package if a boss did not do this to defray the customer manual's sorting costs. But boss home office told Murray they would not do this for just one customer. What was Murray to do? I ignored the threat and look at what increment option Murray said. He persuaded BASP to do a one-month trial using customer-provided labels. BASP logistics and marketing people agreed to meet and coordinate with the customer. The test worked. Attorneys find that being incremental is similar to cross-examination. You lead people step-by-step -step to where you want them to go. The steps lead toward a goal. The difference in negotiating is that the process is not intended to trap people but to help them understand precisely where the other party is coming from. One of the most famous uses of being incremental In a hard bargain situation is a scene in the 1970 movie Five Years Pieces. The Jack Nicholson character asks for a side order of toast in a dinner. The waitress says they don't serve toast. So he orders a chicken salad sandwich on toast. Then he tells the waitress successfully to hold the mayonnaise and the butter and the lettuce and the chicken. His tone is hostile and he gets very angry, but he doesn't have it. He shows the diners stand out to be unreasonable and that they could meet his goals. In this case, though, he causes a sin and doesn't get the post. Those in my class learn from the mistakes of others. Chris Davenport, one of my Columbia Business School students, ordered a Virgin Mary, Blood Mary without vodka at the restaurant. She was told this could not be done. Do you have tomato juice? She calmly asked, yes. 
the waitress said. This continued with four sets tarsier sauce, habasco sauce, and ice. She got the drink. I know. Some of you may think you will spoil your food. Not if your tone is nice. Not if you ask if anyone is going to do that. I once said that to a restaurant and they were absolutely shocked. I would think of that. You might also say that a nice tip is stop coming. If, uh, if you they meet your needs. Even if they won't give you much at first, take what you can get and come back another day. Remember, every ceiling is your new floor. Take the 1% cut in your credit card interest this month. Renegotiate next month. $50 a year and saving five dollars there is a lot of cash at year end. Friend, the key to standards indeed to all successful negotiation is framing. I referred to it earlier in the book, but nowhere is it more important than with the standards. Framing means packaging information or presenting it using specific words and phrases that will be persuasive to, to the other party. Negotiation is very sensitive to the exact words used. The idea is to give people a vision of what the key issues are. Barack Obama used the change. The late John Johnny Cochran in the O.J. Simpson murder trial said to the jury about the blog. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Coca-Cola made billions of dollars on the pearl of pearl that it flashes. Here are a few other examples of how you might frame an issue. If a restaurant is late with a reservation, ask, does this restaurant stand by each one or to my service provider? Is it your goal to make customers happy? Figuring out how to frame things comes from asking yourself the question. What is really going on here? Great negotiators have a firm grasp of the obvious. A Walton Law student, Rina Chu, received an invitation for an American Express card. The bonus for signing up was 5,000 free miles on a participating airline, worth up to about $250 or so. She called American Express and was told that she didn't qualify for the offer because she already had an Amex card. The offer was valid only for new members, she was told. Dina thought about this, then she called back and asked them for a supervisor and told her the issue. She then said, could you tell me who I should talk to about? American Express decision to change its worldwide advertising and positioning for the entire company. What do you mean? The supervisor said, when Lina said, it used to be that American Express had this slogan. Membership has its privilege, but now I find that no members have more privilege than members. So you must have changed your slogan to American Express. No member has its privilege. Who do I talk to about that? The supervisor gave the march on the spot to Lena. Now a finance analyst in New York. Can you imagine this situation getting out to blocks? Craig, 
to issue a new standards in the presence of third parties or implied third parties are very effective. Here, Lina's frame showed that Amex was implying that your customers were more valuable than existing customers put in these terms. Amex preferred to provide the miles. Studies have shown that one person will be much more persuasive than another with the exact same facts because of framing. The more successful negotiator packages the information in a way that creates a different picture in the other person's head. One study often cited has to do with the survival rate for surgery. Some patients are told that an elective surgery has a 90% survival rate. Others are told that the surgery carries a 10% risk of dying. Even though the information is exactly the same and more people elected the surgery, when the choice was presented as a 90% survival rate, a student bought a computer from Comp USA. After a month, the computer broke. He called the salesman who told the student to send the computer back to the manufacturer because it was still under warranty. The student didn't want to do that. It would take time and he needed a computer for school. So the student called the store back and asked for the manager. The student said to the manager, is it your policy to stand behind your local customers? What do you send them away to someone else at the first sign of problems? Of course, we stand behind our products, said the manager. So why are you sending me to the manufacturer when I need a computer for school today? The student asked. That doesn't sound like you are standing behind your product, does it? The student got a loan, a loan, loan, loan computer. In other cases, other students got new replacement computers. Most people would have just complained that the computer is broken or asked. Why should I have to go to all this trouble to get it fixed? And the store manager wouldn't have been swayed. Instead, the student framed it. In terms of the store's own customer service standards and achieved his goals. You may say this isn't rational. Most important negotiations are not about rationality. They are about people's feelings and perceptions. And that is why framing the way information is presented is so important. We can use framing to make the world more fair. PNC Bank in Philadelphia made a mistake on the account of Shunachgir, sh but the student was charged a fee for the overdraft anyway. He asked the bank managers should PNC customers pay for the bank's mistakes. The manager clearly didn't have a good answer to that and didn't know what to do. It was hard for him to make such an admission. So she, not, not a strategic manager at Coca-Cola approved apply the second PNC bank standard. The banks widely advertised commitment to create solutions for customers. How could the bank manager create a solution here, he asked. She now got the refund. 
standards can be used not only with hard bargains but also in search of relationship. The key is to do it in such a way that you preserve the relationship. Remember, you are on the other person's side. You are just helping them to see the issue in a different way. Tahir Kwaji had a two and a half year old daughter, Nadia, who was very unhappy being placed in her high chair for dinner. She wanted to sit at the table with the, with the rest of the family. But instead of telling Nadia what to do or making something up, her father went around the dinner table chair by chair and asked Nadia, Who sits in this chair? This was a fun game for Nadia, one that gave her power to decide where everyone would sit. She played enthusiastically. Soon, all the chairs were taken. Tahir, now a Comcast vice president, didn't then say to Nadia that there was no place at the table for her. Instead, he, she, he asked her what to do. Nadia realized that if she sat in one of the chairs, someone would have to be left out who usually sat at the table. And she realized that she was the only one who could fit in the high chair. Now, clearly, one older child might say, get another chair or be more difficult. For Nadia, in this situation, this was the perfect set of tools. It gave her power, decision-making authority, and an incremental process that helped her see she was the only one who could fit in the high chair. You don't have to accept the other person's standards and framing. A big part of framing is reframing. You start with how they phrase something and you find a different way to interpret it so that they get insight and hopefully will reach your goals. Framing will often change the balance of power in a negotiation no matter how big or powerful the other party. As noted earlier, it should be used carefully and in a positive way. A woman in my MBA class at Wharton was offered a job at McKinsey and one of the world's leading consulting firms. She thought she deserved an extra $30,000 signing bonus because of her years of experience in the sector for which she was hired in media and entertainment. Her boss to be thought she deserved the bonus too. She told her he could not offer it because McKinsey's firm wide parish was to treat all incoming MBA graduates the same. So the student thought about how to reframe McKinsey's standards to meet her goal. Get an extra $30,000 soon, she asked her future boss. Then she learned the soonest was that McKinsey could pay a bonus to a new hire. Three months, the boss replied, so why don't you just pay me the $30,000 three months after I start? She asked, sure, the boss said. Then negotiation took less time than it has taken you to read this account of it. It is much more persuasive to let others make the decision. Instead of telling them what the decision should be, you want to lead them to where you want them to go.
through framing and by being incremental. For parents, as I will show later in the book, these tools work particularly well with children. John, Roche, Wife, Rosemary wanted to get rid of their dog, a large Dalmatian. She hatched the dog, John said, for one thing, the dog, Houdini, kept going through the family's invisible fence, setting up the alarm, and running all over the neighborhood. Neighbors complained. I gave her the opportunity to vent, said John, CFO of Real Estate Investment Trust in New York. Then I asked if, uh, if the dog provides security and companionship to our kids. Yes, she said. Now a little more willing to think about the benefits of the dog. Then he said, if we get rid of the dog, what do we tell the kids? That we got rid of the dog because he was an inconvenience that he couldn't be bothered. There is an old proverb. Don't use a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito. The dog problem wasn't actually a big problem. In fact, it wasn't even a dog problem. It was a fence problem. The solution adjusted the fencing system to keep the dog from setting off the alarm and running all of the neighborhood. Drill down and find the smallest solution necessary to fix the real problem. You can use framing and being incremental to meet your goals in work relationship as well. Peter Tuckers, a dead instrument trader on Wall Street, returned from vacation to find his seat taken. Location is important on the trading floor, he said. His boss had given Peter's seat to a trader who was hired back. One of the conditions of acceptance was that the trader sit at the trading desk where Peter's seat was empty. Most people would have given up at that point. But Peter decided to negotiate it. I asked my boss if Tom was going to trade. How that was distressed that Peter said, Distressed that, his boss replied. So why isn't he sitting with the other distressed that traders? Peter asked. Peter then asked if all the traders should sit at the trading desk. His boss answered yes. Then Peter asked if there were any salesmen sitting at the trading desk. There were. So Peter asked if the salesman had to sit at the trading desk. Peter summoned all of this up and then added that it had taken him a long time to get his seat. Bottom line, he got his seat back. Framing and being incremental are two of the hardest things for people to learn. Most people want to rush ahead and find it hard to break things up into smaller steps. Also, it takes time to get just the right frame. Many people don't have the patience, but great friends can immediately conclude a negotiation in your favor. Kevin Sherlock, a managing director 
at Deutsche Bank frame the situation for a customer demanding a lot of extra work without paying for it. Should we work for free? Said with a collaborative tone. This is very good reality testing for a customer.